What's up YouTube, it's Jacob from International Precision Engineering and today we have a Vico white light interferometer that we'll be tearing down. A lot of my colleagues who went through the same school as me always ask, how do you learn all this stuff? And I think the answer is kind of right here. Taking apart things that were about to be thrown out and figuring out why all these components are where they are. So. What's cool about these instruments is there's something on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars so they can take the extra time to machine something if they need to or make a piece more elaborate. There's not too much on this machine that is really designed to like drive the cost low. Okay, It's all about performance and functionality and now that it's 15, 20 years old, something like that, now we can take it apart because it's not really worth much. Nevertheless, I think the best course of action for this is to tear it down on camera so that everybody can learn what's in there and hopefully it'll, we'll all learn just a little bit or maybe inspire us to make our designs a little bit better or maybe we're just entertained for a half hour, an hour, however long this takes sitting on the couch. All right, so looking down at the table here, this is the sort of objectives, the turret here, so you can switch between objectives. This goes underneath the measurement head, and this here is the sort of four axis motion system, so the fifth axis would have been moving the head up and down here. You can see on this knob it's melted, um, and right now this is just sitting in here now, normally that clamp is tight so it can't spin. Alright, so we got two motorized linear axes, X and Y, and then this is tip-tilt for leveling out your sample to the reference mirrors. Looking at the X, Y axis here, okay, so it's nothing special in terms of um, like being unique. I, th I think this sort of clamp thing we'll come back to in a second, but other than that, these motion stages are just normal cross slide. Let me make sure that you can see this. So they're normal cross slide ball bearing screw driven stages, okay? So they're, they're nothing really, um, I don't know, they are precision stages, so they're probably sub-micron and flatness and tilt throughout their travel and things like that. But other than that, you know, you could get that from Newport or Thor Labs for a couple hundred bucks. So this isn't anything real special. So zooming in on the tip tilt stage, now this is cool, okay? There's a lot of sort of thought and design and forethought in this. This is, a, there's a lot of custom parts in this. So first of all, you could see that we have an adjuster screw here that drives on a flat plate and then a spring driving the, the stage two towards the screw, okay? So if we pull on this, you could see that it just swings. Now, you also notice that it's rocking as it's translating, right? So the center of rotation is designed to be right at the top of the stage. And they do this so that it tilts without translating. See, so as this screw drives this, if your sample was here, it would translate and rotate. So if you put this at the center of rotation, you don't have any translation, you only have tilt, okay? And then there's two axes of this with two screws. So that means that these cross slides here have to be radiused the same and concentric to these, or have the same center of curvature as all, all four of these have to do it. Otherwise, you're gonna get some sort of crosstalk between this tilting axis and this tilting axis if these aren't perfectly aligned. So there's a lot of money in assembly just in this component, let alone design and manufacture of it, just the assembly. So this definitely isn't something that you're gonna wanna tear apart if you ever think that you might want to use this. This is something that you just leave alone. The objective turret 
also is something that we'll probably end up reusing in another project. The, the challenge here is the thread for the objectives is always different for different manufacturers. And even as you can see here, some of these objectives here are have adapters, right? So this is the thread that's in the turret and then this is the thread for the objective, okay? And then that's just sort of the game you gotta play. So, but that's no big deal. You can turn these on a lathe pretty easily. The challenge is finding out where the focal distance of the objective, if this is infinity corrected here, what's the focal distance down here, and then making sure that for all the objectives in the set that they're the same. So now you can switch between magnifications and not have to change your Z. And on this tool, they didn't have an automated Z either. It was just like a hand crank. So they, they took extra care. So even if this was the same thread, sometimes these are just spacers to, to sort of correct that. These are Michelson interferometer objectives. Okay, and I think the best thing to do here would be to sort of draw this out on the whiteboard, but really all it is is however you want to look at it, the light will come down, hit a beam splitter, half of it will go to this reference mirror, and half of it will come out, hit off your sample, come back, and then the the light coming in that got split will recombine at the beam splitter and then come back up and show an interference pattern on the screen. So we'll, hopefully I can sort of do that on the whiteboard or something like that as slides. But these objectives are, even in their used state, are around a couple thousand dollars each for the Michelson ones and for the Moreau ones that are out of here, they're upwards of five or 10,000. So these aren't something that we wanna be throwing around or taking apart, but they're really simple. It's just a beam splitter, a reference mirror, and a focusing optic. So the difference between the Moreau is that there's no, uh, the reference path is actually a sort of sputtered pattern on the lens and it's, it's axial rather than actually off a leg like this. Okay, so the, the deal with the Michelson is that they tend to be longer working distances and the focus optics tend to be lower magnifications and that's why the Moreau's are more expensive just because uh, higher magnification objectives just always tend to be more. In terms of engineering on the collet or on the turret here, there's not much, so you can see in this hole here, let me make sure it's focused, you can see in this hole here there's just a little spring um, flexure there, and then if we flip it over, you can see the mating portion, if you get the angle right, you can see the mating portion on, machined into the other half of it, okay? So as it goes around, you could just sort of feel it click on that spring, and that's it. So. The challenge and the sort of difference in cost of these turrets is how, sort of what's the run out of the bearings, how repeatable is that detent, are there sensors in there that tell the machine which objective you're looking through, so all those stuff sort of drive up the cost. And on this one, I'm really surprised that there's not a repeatable mount on here, and I think that what happens with Vico is that when they mount it, or, or any time the, the unit is serviced, and that's the whole unit, the whole thing is calibrated to itself, okay? So it doesn't really matter where this is in terms, terms of the optical axis of the rest of the optics and the camera, because anytime someone changes it, it gets recalibrated, okay? This screw here just drives sort of a pin into a slot, and we'll see that on the other half, and then these sort of just hold it up at, and without being having to get from the bottom, they kind of just come in at an angle so that you don't have to take this apart while you're trying to put it on. All right, so really nothing else clever on this. And here is the measurement head. So the this mounts on the machine like this, okay, and then the sort of the plastic cover is about like this, and they have some doors and things that you can access these controls here, and sort of these filter selectors. Yeah, so let's just 
before we get into this, let's look at how they mounted it or how the turret mounts to the head, right? So here's that pin and it's got a tiny little slot in it <clears throat> that this screw drives into, okay? So it pulls it and it, and it sort of takes the, the load coming up and down. And then these two screws here just go sort of into this plate that's machined to receive them, okay? And then the flat face just engages with the flat face and then there's this um, sort of boss that goes into this recess, okay? And that's it. And then that also is where the optical axis sort of comes out and meets the objectives down here. So the plate that it's sitting on, it's just a plate with a hole in it, okay? And then I just have this pin dropped through the hole. So when we're spinning on this, this doesn't move at all. It's just sliding on this plate. The way that it's mounted to the machine is this piece of stainless steel here is actually bolted to the frame. And, and I just have it on here to kind of hold it all together. But when we start tearing down, this plate here is actually what's sitting on the machine that this whole measurement head interfaces to. So walking around this thing, what we're looking at, <laughs> There's a lot going on here and I think it'll become apparent as we start taking it out. But this stack here is the illumination source, okay? So we have some controls that control the centering and things like that. Then we have some filters sort of higher up in the column here. A fold mirror which takes the axis of illumination from here and then bounces it in and then there's probably a beam splitter here that drives it down through. Okay, and then the light would come back up through some um, zoom optics, okay, so this is like a 1x, and then it comes up and hits into the camera here. So the illumination axis from the side, there's all sorts of cooling fins and things that we can look at in here. The sort of electronics interface panel here, and that's a pretty much about it, okay? And then there all the, this wire here, I think was to interface to, on the front cover, there's actually a TV screen that you could, I don't know what it was for, for settings or something like that, or to see a live view of whatever you're trying to measure, I'm not sure, I never, I've never used this particular machine. Zooming into the side of this, you can see this is the stainless plate that I was talking about that mounts to the machine. And if you noticed, it's sprung. Okay, so the mounting hardware isn't even holding this thing on. The only thing that this, this bolt, and there's one more on the other side here, the only thing that those do is if this whole machine were to ever tip over, it's to keep the measurement head from flying completely off. But you notice that it's not holding anything on. So this whole measurement head relies on gravity to hold it down onto this stainless plate. And when we, when I take this apart, I'll sort of explain why, okay? And here's this other screw sort of hidden behind this selector arm here. All right, so we've got it apart. Already you could see, so this is a custom screw, okay? And would take this washer, which is cupped, so it's a stamped washer. This is right. The screw is relieved. So it's threaded on the bottom and then relieved all the way through here so that this can thread into the bottom piece and then the spring can float without catching on threads, okay? And these are the types of details that you see when you're buying a really expensive piece of equipment. And like if there's ever a low dollar copy, these are the sorts of corners that they're gonna cut. They're not gonna relieve the screw and then what's gonna happen is like, the washer's gonna catch on the threads and it's not gonna be freely sliding, okay? And the reason that they have that, okay, is if you look at how this was mounted, okay, or, or we could start with this plate here, right? These screws just go thread into there, so it's just a threaded hole, but you'll notice, okay, so here were the four, here were the four mounting holes where it actually bolted to the frame. And then there's a cone, a flat, and a slot. And what that interfaces to is 
on this on the measuring head here, there's three spheres. One, two, and three. If you put a sphere into a cone, it will have three degrees of freedom. So it will be constrained in all the Cartesian directions. So it would be X, Y, and Z are all constrained, okay? If the sphere was smaller diameter, yes, it would sit lower down in the cone than a bigger diameter sphere, but nevertheless, once it's in there, it can't move in X, Y, or Z, but it can still rotate around pretty much any direction, right? So here we constrain the device or the measurement head in three degrees of freedom. Putting a flat here, it could still, if I'm constrained positionally here at, at the cone, I can rotate in any direction, but if I have a sphere sitting on a flat here, I can still rotate around the line between them, but I can't, if gravity is keeping the sphere onto that flat surface, I can't rotate in this direction. So now we're constrained in one additional, so we have four degrees of freedom, and then the additional sphere in the slot will constrain in our third direction. So this constrains all six degrees of freedom. So a cone in a, in a sort of a V slot is going to keep it from rotating in, in the plane of the fixture and it's going to stop the rotation around this line. So we have all six degrees of freedom constrained, so when you sit this down on here it can't move in any direction as, unless you're going to overcome the force of gravity to push you up the ramp and make these spheres pop out of the grooves. But the other clever thing about the this configuration and several other con configurations is that as this heats up and expands there's freedom in here and it won't warp the tool it'll just slide in the slot and on the plane okay so yes if my optical axis is here it will move but they've designed this to sort of minimize that but the important thing is you're not going to add stress to the measurement device through the sort of mounting system because of this Calvin clamp. Another design that they could have done if they wanted to keep the optical axis centered then they could have done all three as slots <clears throat> and pointed all of the slots at the optical axis. So if it expands, it will expand around, like away from that optical axis and the optical axis won't move. But anyway, this is sort of a standard, uh, this kinematic clamp or Calvin clamp or kinematic mount. This is also a way to repeatedly mount things in and out of fixtures in things like CMMs or whatever, and it will always repeat back, or it's the most repeatable way to get something in and out of a machine. We're looking at the top of this thing here, so I took this radiation shield off, or either heat or RF. Inside was a ribbon cable that went to here. We have a ferrite core to stop noise in the ribbon cable, we have all the interface connections from the back, the coax, that just went to this thing. So again, that just went to the screen. Then we took this inner heat shield off and re revealed the camera board. This is just a testament to the quality that they can put into when they charge what they charge for this. I mean, look at this screw. This is a 1.5 millimeter Allen head or Allen wrench and that screw is tiny. There's probably two or three threads on that screw, okay? This is just to hold the heat shield on. These are even smaller <clears throat> in here. Here's another example here. So you can see that these, this sort of interface plate went to the radiation shield. It's thick enough that they could have just tapped that plate, but instead they put these stainless they put these stainless 
so I'm not going to call them bolts. They're like meant to be glued or, or welded to the actual plate itself that the screw threads into. So yeah, you could say in one respect, yeah, well that might be cheaper because these can be mass produced, but assembly is not cheap. On the back of the camera board here, they had this aluminum plate that interfaced with this pocket here. Now keep in mind that they want this to be able to flex a little bit. And then this piece here, so this essentially will constrain it sort of, and what I, my first thought was, oh, they're gonna set the angle of the camera, right? And then if you look at the, on the bottom of this, when you take this off, there's a little sort of radius pocket with a slug in there that this will bolt to so you can fine tune the camera angle on the screen to the instrument. Now I wonder, I don't know why, but this is like a phenolic or like OSB thing here, and I think it's to isolate the board ground from the um, instrument ground. And when you take the camera off, you can see basically the same thing. So the, the camera chip here is threaded, or the camera interface thing is threaded, but it's threaded into a Delrin um, piece here. So this is completely, the grounds and everything, this is completely electrically isolated from the instrument instrument itself. Now, by today's standard, this is a tiny little measurement sensor, but one thing to keep in mind is that this camera is probably not just a camera. It's probably the camera, all your filtering electronics, a frame grabber, and possibly even a, um, a preprocessor so that Instead of sending a stack of images back to the camera, it sends a few images and measurement statistics or one image that contains sort of the height data itself. Then it sends it back to the computer through the ribbon cable itself. So the reason that the camera sensor is small is so that you could process really, really fast. We got the screws off of the camera alignment fixture plate and looking at it, one of these screws, okay, so you have two screws that come in here and set sort of the angle of the camera and then of course it's not only a um, radius pocket but it's sort of like a T, like a T slot and then there's a steel blank in there. Looking at the screws, one of them has a brass tip and then one of them had either a plastic or aluminum or something, but it's actually sprung. I don't know if you could see that in the camera, but but this is sprung this way. So the spring pushes always towards the brass tip. So this is your, this is actually your adjustment screw and then this one just kind of tensions it towards the brass so that there's no backlash in there. But these are the types of things, I mean, this is a machined piece that the only function it serves is to set the camera angle with, which, you know, you could probably do just by hand pretty easily, but this is just the testament of why these instruments cost so much, because there's precision adjustments in here. And then they, they didn't even cut corners on sort of the locking mechanism. It's all kinematic, so if this expands, it can expand into the spring and the angle is set by the brass. I mean, it's just unreal how much stuff goes into this. Underneath this plate here, we're kind of getting into the um, illumination stack, which I kind of want to save for later, but I mean, just look at all the machining in this plate, right? Like, if you were going to design something and have it be a little bit cheaper, you wouldn't to do all this pocketing and if you notice on here is some numbers they're like minus three minus two minus one and then 90 270 zero and they're actually machined in unlike the part number which is just screen printed or stamped and it looks like it's a lapped finish
to me. So they, they machined it out, fly cut it, and then actually lapped, <laughs> lapped the thickness. I don't know if that's just a surface finish thing or if that's actually lapping the thickness and that's what these um, what these numbers represent is minus two thousandths or something. Um, I can't imagine it would be micron with this visibly fly cut surface. So it's probably thousandths or a, um, an assembly procedure or something like that. But it's a lot of stuff going into it. A little tiny plate that all this thing did was <laughs> hold up your camera right or, or not even this was isolated from the camera so the only thing this does is hold on this filter selector which we'll come back to here's the reason for that cover plate it's being machined so if you notice this body is actually curved and the machine blank goes pretty much right to the depth of the sides of those curves so it's just to block the light from coming behind the shield and into the optical path. Always a reason. And we've got this taken down pretty much to the body itself. Two things. One, this filter adjuster essentially just slides into this groove in the illumination path and then bolted up to the top of the frame. So this just comes out and we'll come back to it later. The other thing is on the front we had that thumb wheel. Okay, the thumb wheel went down in here and then this bolt just came in and it tensioned in this little slot here to kind of hold it once you got it set. Now it's shaped this way because if you remember on the back we had a port here. So this is essentially what this is, is this goes down in like this in this direction so the light can either come up through, the light can either come up through the optical axis, hit this 45 degree angle and if there were a pellicle beam splitter here which could be a, just a piece of half silvered glass it could come up and hit this way and come out or the light could come this way and get injected into the stream but on this model there's nothing but this clearly having this machined away tells me that this made in another model to have something here too now i wanted to kind of talk about this thumb wheel so if you look at the thread on this I don't know if you can really see it, but it's probably half millimeter pitch. Okay, and then you have this huge sort of maybe 75 millimeter um, diameter thing. Now, keep in mind that with thread pitch, right, so if you go one full revolution, you'll probably go down a half or, or one pitch if it's single start. It could be double start. I don't know, and I didn't take a look at it, and it's not full, so it'd be really hard to kind of diagnose that without a dial gauge or something, but essentially, let's just say it's single start. If you went around one full revolution, this whole thing would drop by one thread pitch, right? So that means that you have, let's say it's a half millimeter, a whole revolution gives me a half millimeter, but with this giant radius, I can really fine tune, I can move this slowly and it comes up or down very little and looking at it I can tell you it's not single start so it's multi start so there's a little bit less control in there but the reason for the big diameter and small pitch is just to give you a lot of control Just to kind of recap on the whole optical axis, remember the camera sat up here, there was a thumb wheel adjustment that moved the height of the camera up here. We had a beam splitter that went in here but it wasn't in this model. This is a interchangeable optic here for this one's 1x and there's nothing in it. 
here there's nothing in it so it's just sending the light through if it were two or three or four x there'd just be a lens down in this tube down in the body of this thing there's a whole bunch of other optics and in the back here there's a little finger motor and some stuff so there's an optic that moves up here and that's the fast scanning axis so i can't really get into that without tearing this thing completely down so i think we i'll switch to the illumination side of things and then tear this all down and then go back to this main body here so this illumination tube comes on goes on to there and we just took the screws off there's four screws in there and it interfaces on this um, same thing as the the bottom there's just a boss that goes into a recess on here now because this has adjustments for the angle and position of the illumination the alignment of this isn't super critical <clears throat> so just like had a head on a car there's two bolts here that drop way down all the way to here <clears throat> you take those out and this whole piece lifts off and while this is off, you could really see all the detail in the manufacturing of this thing. It's just incredible how much, you know, all these real deep pockets, those are real expensive to machine. And all these real deep, narrow places, that's all real expensive when you go to have that done. And now they could have blocked this off when they anodized it, but a lot of times it's just easier to have it sent out anodized and then when it comes back set this on a surface plate and have it decked again so there's a lot of operations in a part like this it's just incredible to see something like that and hold it you know you could take that to a machine shop and quote it and it would be big money especially considering they're only making maybe a couple hundred of these machines per model too so i mean there's just just the ex expense of the microscope body itself it's just unreal again we're looking at the unit from the front and you could see that this piece here just was screwed on and again it's the only thing it does is hold this lens tube makes it so that the user could pop it in and out we got a set screw here with a spherical tip and then that sets basically how far this thing snaps in and out or the tilt essentially in this axis one piece of aluminum we've got yeah that's all one piece this was turned on a lathe and this is milled you got these little stainless flexures to grab the part bunch of tapped holes <clears throat> we got the screws out the motor there's little access back here that you can get to the set screws on the helical beam coupler and then take the bracket motors which again were rubber mounted and then this just comes out electrical connector little mullex this sensor here came up and out of this pocket and I can't take this plate off because of this wire here is holding it on. But, <clears throat> so we, you can look down the barrel of this sensor here and see that there's nothing in there. You can see it's hollow. And then there's just this little rod that it kind of slips down over. So this tells me that this is probably the displacement sensor for the floating carriage. So if you move this up and down right so remember this is fixed to the body of the instrument so when the optics move up and down that's the that's the sensor that tells it where it is so we took these screws out and noticed that this was sprung and i was wondering where it was but there's the piezo actuator and that's why it's sprung is because this has to be preloaded so what this is is a stack of little sort of 
slices of ceramic that when a voltage is applied they grow but only about 0.1 percent so if this is 20 millimeters long if this actuator is 20 millimeters long then this whole thing only grows 20 micron all right so i think we have it figured out here okay so remember the frame grabs on this part the objectives hang from this so i can push this in and out Okay, and it, when this is the only moving part really on this system right now, and remember our piezo went here to push on the back of this plate here, which had a spring preloading it. So essentially the piezo is going to be so stiff that the spring just keeps it in contact with the piezo and then it can grow really only slightly. So kind of a lot going on in this mechanism, but but it kind of just boils down to all of this is a sort of complicated lever mechanism for the screw to move it, move the objectives up and down in course, and then the piezo to move it fine during measurement. Okay, when I push on the objectives, you could see this carriage coming up and down, moving these pins. And what keeps it in line is this cross slide right here. So gravity pushes the carriage down and keeps it down. Our displacement sensor measures the position of it. The piezo can move this thing up and down a little bit. And these pins hit the V-groove on this floating plate here, okay? So, so this is interesting. These are actually ball bearings that roll on this screw here. These are actually needle bearings that roll on a custom screw. And you'd think that they would, all this machining, they would round it out, but they didn't, probably for light. And the only way to get this out is to have a screwdriver that hits flush here you get a half a turn and then you have to switch it back because the screw is right centered with the top of this deck. Here's sort of a better view of this rocker plate. So the ball bearings fell into this little groove which is actually polished and ground flat or ground and polished flat then the ball bearings can actually roll on here. So if this, the fulcrum of this is not perfectly centered on these screws, they'll roll and keep the friction down. So you have a slot for your piezo, you've got a land for the sphere on your spring, then you've got the screw can actually move inside of this keeper thing here. And there's three bearings. There's one on the carriage or, or the part that's moving, there's one in the top aluminum and then there's a ball bearing in the bottom of that one um, and this is shouldered so the motor is pushing on this to keep it down keep, keep the backlash out it's a lot of uh so you could see they did this with a they didn't use a three axis machine when they made this these are ground but this uh, slope here is actually just cut in probably with a ball nose bit because you, you, know, you feel the surface roughness go way up. And it's some kind of steel because it's flash rusting. So we have this whole carriage apart. Um, this is this, this here is the optics piece. So there's the lens. You can see it's sort of like a stack of lenses. Actually down here are the lenses and this gray thing here is actually a prism. So you can see this diagonal line here. So there are two um, halves are ground sort of in a 90 degrees and then the other side is ground in a 45 degrees. There's a silver coating on there that's like 50% 
um, clear so like 50% of the light will bounce off the mirror and 50% will go through if it's a 50-50 beam splitter and then they glue those together and just into a square so that you could sort of mount it and mount all of your lenses and things inside of a kind of a carrier here so I think you could see it you could actually see my finger in the granite here but also you, if this was through you'd be able to see right through it so let me see if I could yeah so you could if my hand is up here you could see my hand but also see my finger through here right so you could so that's basically your beam splitter and then there's just some mag optics in here and this carrier the carrier was bolted into this plate here and it had the spring on it to keep it from moving and um, this plate here kind of went on the back and if you remember bolted to this plate was our um, the cross slide and this is pretty cool so this there's three parts to the cross slide okay so it kind of goes like this so you bolt these two to one face and then this one to another okay and then this just slides in here and this is really cool these are recirculating cross slides so that they can have full contact throughout the full travel range right so through through pretty much this giant range even though they're only moving a little since this is a precision instrument and they don't want see the more you hang off the bearings the more sort of slop you'll have so they want full contact all the time and if you look at this these bearings here are actually every other one is a roller bearing pointed towards the opposite direction and then that rolls on sort of a precision ground V groove right and then these are just rubber banded in there but now recirculating means is that they go off into here around the track and then back out so you'll always have full contact so that the other kind is just non recirculating and then they only put balls in half and then the balls roll to this side and then back and that does give you sort of full travel but it doesn't give you full contact all the time it's only like half contact so this would be pretty much equivalent to like a ball bearing right a ball bearing would technically be considered um, recirculating but it's just not in sort of this oval track and on a ball bearing like this one it's contacting around the entire race all the time anyway so it's kind of this same principle but sort of shifted towards the linear looking at the optical illumination now the lamp just comes off and it's on just sort of a split clamp here bolts cinch down okay you can see in there is the um the bulb which is in there with just one screw and a sort of concentric bore and this is pretty cool so this bulb here has a what I guess four axis I don't know three or four axis adjustment on it so the Z comes in and out on this little translation stage so it's probably just a spring a screw a concentric bore and then this set screw keeps it from rotating so if we take that out we could probably so here I just cut the zip tie that was holding the wire. Okay, there's the spring down in there that was holding this, letting this go in and out. And you could see here there's a spring and a pin holding this together on that Kelvin clamp. So if we, you could rock this off and that sphere will likely just fall out so it's probably just held in but by a little bit of glue a little bit of grease so you could see the sphere so once again the sphere is in a cone this screw here is in a flat 
and this screw is in a v-groove so once again we have our Kelvin clamp holding that all together and then just a little screw holding the bulb down onto the mounting plate here that's pretty cool coming back to this all this is really is a heat sink the clamp and then there's a spherical mirror there or probably parabolic mirror that just focuses or collimates the light coming down the tube so the bulb itself being in here is not the source or is not the most desired source because that will spread the light the desired source is actually off this mirror that's collimating the light perfectly straight down the axis itself <clears throat> and I don't think that I really want to take this whole thing apart but you can see that 45 surface again this is another beam splitter so the light comes down hits the beam splitter and then goes off at a 45 degree angle into there there's a couple things that are cool um, first of all this slider here controls this iris and I try and get the light the best that it can but you could see this iris opening up in there and I'll try and take a better picture but this is just like a camera aperture there's a bunch of little sort of plates that hinge in as this screw in here turns or rotates there's a ring that rotates around that and then all those blades sort of come in or out and there's enough of them that it looks like a circle but it's just a bunch of sort of fins that pop in and out this one here sort of the same thing except it controls two of them this one here I think is just to keep the adjuster parallel so that they can come around down to here instead of just having the pin straight out but you can see again there's a little um, as you pull the slider out there's a little cam in there that comes and rotates another um, device and I can't see what it is in there but it's possibly another aperture um, most likely and then that should be it so there's a couple other lenses in here just to sort of get the focal plane right or out of the way and then if you remember this filter selector just kind of went into the slot here mounted on another thing and as you can see here there's a couple dichroic filters on there um, on this camera it's kind of hard to see what color but you could sort of see a red tinge on here so this is this blocks most wavelengths except red off here and then this might be the opposite way so up towards the blue or UV and then the middle is just clear and then this whole huge stainless thing I think is just to take the load because this detent for the filter selector is actually pretty hard that's it so that's that's pretty much what's in a precision instrument so you can see that there's a ton of these custom screws here but you know each one of these costs money to make and each all this part to, that's designed specifically for them is just super expensive if you don't believe me just go on Thor Labs or Edmund Optics and each each one of these filters is probably a couple hundred bucks on there and they're probably buying them maybe a couple hundred at a time or maybe a thousand at a time but they're not selling a million of these like car auto manufacturers you can see that everything is sort of everything in there is sort of brass sliders or ball bearings even these rotator things in there there's little ball bearings around there just to keep the friction down so you're not pulling this machine out of calibration right all these sliders so in there that even looks like a uh, like a, a ruby or sapphire or something I mean just there's there's not too much expense spared so like I said it's all about performance and quality and there's just a ton of machining in here on all these features to get this right and this is you know threaded this inserts threaded in so that it's not the anodized surface is not acting like a bearing surface right there's some kind of like Teflon coating on this screw here and it's just amazing to look at all the detail in these machines but anyway thank you for watching I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did I've got to get cleaning all of this pile of parts sort out what I want to keep and what I don't I don't know how much longer I'm gonna have this sitting around but if 
anybody needs a certain thing like a halogen bulb on a crazy kinematic mount for steering or beam splitters or lenses, let me know. If there's something that you saw that I didn't catch, leave a comment. Um, I'm sure that everybody else would enjoy hearing something that you picked out that I didn't. I mean, there's just so much here. We could spend all day talking about different types of reflecting optics and things and how to make a clamp and, and sort of design and what type of anodizing and sliding surfaces. There's just so much to talk about, but hopefully there will be more. If you like this, I'll definitely make more, um, but tell me what you think. Thank you. Bye.